Hey everyone, my name is David Rao and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest, and a variety of other places when you search for my name, David Rao, or Make Moments Matter. Um, I'm so excited that you decided to spend uh, your night with me talking about music education. Um, I, you know, I, I keep telling people as music teachers we don't get enough time to talk about our lessons and to talk about what's working and to talk about what's not working. And so <clears throat> that's why it's so nice to have the internet and um, things like this where we can you know, get together virtually and, and share some of those ideas. So tonight what I'm planning on doing is I'm planning on sharing um, a little bit about um, microphones, a quick follow-up from last week. I'm gonna talk through all my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons for the week, and then I'm gonna talk about starting ukulele. Um, this is my second year teaching ukulele to a large group of students, and so um, I learned some things last year, and I thought I would share just a few tips um, and uh, tricks, things that have worked, and then get your advice too, uh, because I know a lot of you are starting ukulele um, or have started this year or have ideas, and so I'd love to share more about that because it's something that we're all sort of learning together. Um, quickly, a couple quick things. Um, if you have any questions along the way, if you're like, hey, what's that thing that he was um, just showing? If you want to know about the resources that I'm holding in my hand, I have a whole page on my blog devoted to just those links and um, uh, pictures and things where you can sort of see those resources that I'm actually holding here in the room if you want them for yourself. And you can find that um, at the bottom of the caption here on Facebook or my LinkedIn profile. There's a, um, a place where you can go to the Musical Mondays video recap page on my blog um, or you can go to makemomentsmatter.org slash video and you can find those there too. But all the links of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are there in case you're like, hmm, I want to go buy that I don't know, those, that set of Lummy sticks. They're there um, if you're interested in them. Um, and that's, like I said, it's linked on Facebook at the bottom of the caption and um, on Instagram on the LinkedIn profile. Um, another thing, if you're on Facebook, um, you can join the uh, Every Moment Matters uh, music education group and it's a place where if you have questions or if you have ideas, you want to ask things, um, you can can uh, join there and um, I, I usually jump in and, and, and try and dialogue with folks there. But a lot of people have had really great comments and questions and it's sort of nice to see um, people just talking and answering. It's like we're having a virtual uh, chance to just walk across the hall and connect. So if you want to join, that's a great uh, group you can join. Um, one last thing before I get started. So um, I was so excited and lucky to be in Oklahoma last week in Tulsa at the Oklahoma Music Educators Association Conference. It was so great to meet so many people there. Um, I'm excited this week I'm going to be at the Georgia Music Educators Conference, which is my home state conference, and I'm lucky enough to be able to present uh, two sessions there. So I hope I'll get to see you there this week if you live in Georgia. It's this uh, weekend. I'm presenting Friday and Saturday. And then if you live in South Carolina, I'm going to be in Columbia at the SCMEA convention on February 8th, and I'm doing um, two workshops on that Saturday. So I'm excited. I hope I'll be able to meet more people there. One of my favorite things about going around the country and doing stuff like that is just meeting people. And um, it was so much fun to walk around the exhibit hall and chat with folks and get to know more people better. Um, it's just a, a great chance to get to, to meet and learn together. Because as a great music education community, we are such a cool, diverse group of people. And it's so nice to meet more people and, and learn from everyone else. Okay, so the, the plan for tonight, I'm going to quickly talk about my microphone that I use. Uh, I talked about it a little bit last week, but, uh, you know, it's just so important to protect your voice, you know, because you use it so often singing, speaking, um, trying to get kids' attention. And so um, I think a classroom microphone is a huge, huge, huge resource and tool that music teachers sort of underutilize or just teachers in general underutilize. But last week I talked about the, the system that I have and I forgot to bring one of them back with me home to show you. So I brought it this week I wanted to show you. So um, the system that I bought initially, it's about $38. You can get it on Amazon. And I know I put it linked last week. Um, is this this system here, um, and it's a really cool system. It has a belt pack that you wear on your belt or you can put in your pocket or whatever, and it comes with two different microphones, one of which I just dropped. Hold on. It's got the, I like to call it the preacher mic <laughs> because my dad's a pastor, but um, it, it like the little lapel mic that you can clip on here if you want. It works fine. Um, the one that I like a little bit better, um, I call the Britney mic, and um, it's because I feel like, uh, 
Britney Spears and like Baby One More Time or something or Backstreet Boys or whatever. I don't know. But you can put it on like this. I don't like this. This makes me feel uncomfortable. So I like to wear it around my neck. You can just hook it around your neck and then you can point the microphone up. That works really super well. Um, and this is a great system. So like I said, this just plugs in um, to your belt pack and then you can put your belt pack on your belt, in your pocket, whatever, and it transmits pretty well. I've never had the little antenna break off. Cross your fingers on that. Um, the one thing about this system, um, the, on the other end, the receiver um, looks like this, and it can hook in, you can see by quarter inch cable, it can hook into a sound system if you have a sound board um, or a, a way to connect. It also comes with this adapter, so if you don't have a quarter inch connector, it can connect up to this aux cable. So this plugs into most, you know, if you have a classroom speaker system, um, if you wanna plug it into like a Bluetooth boombox speaker or something, this will connect really easily. So um, it's a very simple system. It's only $38. So if you're like, my school's not gonna pay for it, I'm just gonna, I wanna get something for myself. Or maybe you say, my school's not gonna pay for it. and I don't, you know, I, I don't want to pay for this and then not be able to take it with me if I ever move jobs or whatever. This is a great system to buy. It's so inexpensive um, and it works so well. Now, some of the reviews I read online before I got it said, oh, it was sort of spotty. And I think in the first week that I got it, I might have thought that too. But the reason it was spotty was because I was running low on batteries. So in this system, it takes two double A's here in the receiver sorry, two triple A's. It takes two double A's in the battery pack. They don't run out at the same time. So if this one runs out, but this one's still good, it's like, wait, which, this one has a little indicator to show you that the battery's running low, but, but still, like you don't wanna run over and change batteries or have a battery die or whatever. So my solution to that, because it was sort of, you know, not working was I got, um, Another system you can get on Amazon comes with this little charger, charging station, and it comes with eight batteries, which is fantastic because I need both double A's and triple A's. So it comes with four double A's and four triple A's. So you can have two triple A's in your receiver, two triple A's in your belt pack, and the other four can be charging on the charging station. So what I typically do is I just have four charging and four in the system at any given point. And then if, you know, at lunch or whenever I wanted to change out the batteries, then I know it's gonna be working in the afternoon. Um, it's a really easy, simple thing to do. This charging station cost me another 20, maybe 25, I don't remember. I think about $20. So with all of that together, it costs about 50 or $60, it, it, unless your school wants to pay for batteries or whatever. But the whole, the nice thing about it is it's very simple to use, it's easy, and it works in so many different ways. Um, I might have shared this last year, but uh, one of the cool things I did was for my concert, I wore this in the gym, and this worked really well to pick up my voice. At one point in the middle of the concert, I wanted to amplify my ukulele, but my ukulele is not electric, and there was no easy way to amplify it. Well, I use the hug strap, which is a special strap that goes around your ukulele and it, it hugs here in the waist of your ukulele. And I don't have an end pin or anything, so this makes it so I don't have to drill a hole into the ukulele to put the strap on. It's a really cool strap in and of itself, right? But then what I realized was I could take the lapel mic, I could take it under the ukulele and clip it onto the hug strap and it would sit basically right here and it would amplify my ukulele like amazingly well. I had to just be careful that as I'm strumming, I didn't hit it. So I tried this for a while and then I was able to sort of snake it up on top or I forget where exactly I put it, but I was able to clip it onto the hug strap so that it would pick up the sound and amplify it and I didn't run into it with my hand or my sleeve or whatever. But that's, it's a really cool like hack and it just happened that like I had this one that I wasn't using as a microphone because I was using the Britney mic. And I was also had the hug strap, which just happened to be there and it just magically worked. So um, if you have a system like this, you could maybe hook up the lapel mic and amplify your ukulele. It just happened to be what worked for me for my concert and was a cool random thing that happened. Um, okay, this is a great mic. But remember, um, I showed this, the, the other one I have, I showed this off last week, 
This is the system I currently have in my classroom, and this is one that I think my PTA bought. Um, the difference is this one is about $200 more. <laughs> um, but it is so simple. All you have to do is put this on, you press a little button, and bam, it's on. You wear it around your neck, it's not up in your face. Um, it works so, so well. The receiver, um, it plugs in. Um, there, which I don't have the plug right now, but it plugs into just a regular outlet. And, it, and then there's an auxiliary cord that, that you can plug into any system. The super amazing thing about this is you don't have to fiddle with batteries. You don't have to worry about cords. You don't have to worry about things getting tangled. None of that. It just sits around your neck. It turns right on. Boop, boop, it's done. It's on. You know it's on. <clears throat> um, it has an indicator when the battery goes low, but it charges by a charging cord, so it has a rechargeable battery in it. It's super light. This is always just charging on its own. Um, no muss with batteries, no stress about any of that. I think that's why I have to pay the extra $200 because it's so simple and so easy. But this did not, when I tried to use this in the gym for a concert, it was terrible. It was feedback, it was gross, it didn't work. I actually went back to the other system I had. So if you're planning on using the microphone like for concerts only, or or if you just want a system that's maybe a little more versatile, I would say maybe get the, the $38 one. If you want something for your classroom that you can use every day and be, have a workhorse system, just be fantastic. This one is great for you too. And if you're not paying it for yourself, if your PTA is buying it, this is a great system. But I have links to both of those. Um, I don't know that you can buy this one on Amazon, but I have a link to the listing on Amazon so you can like see it and, and then get the the numbers you would need to um, go and find it on a different website. But I have both of those linked there. But whatever you do, look for a microphone. I, it feels weird to you, the teacher, for about three days. For the kids, it's weird for about mm, maybe 10 minutes. And after that, they forget you have it on or don't care. And I think as adults that we're a little self-conscious about hearing our voice, like anytime you go and like listen to your voice on a recording or when you hear it through a speaker system, it feels weird at first, but it is such an amazing thing. It means that I don't try and over project. It means that I don't have to fight to be heard. I mean, it, it is a super fabulous resource and it's going to save your voice because you need that voice for years and years and years to teach. So it's a, a great resource to have no matter what sort of amplification system you get. Both of those are pretty simple, pretty easy and have, have worked really well in my classroom. I can attest to that. Anyway, whatever you do, look for a mic. They're great to have. Okay, so quick mic review. Let me then talk about my kindergarten through fifth grade lessons for the week. I'm gonna share quickly sort of through all of them. And then I just wanna talk about ukulele because that's sort of what I'm doing with fourth and fifth grade right now. And um, I've learned some things on the way and I, I mean, I wanna learn more, but I wanna share with you what I've learned and then um, give y'all a chance for if you have questions or ideas or things you wanted to shout out so we can sort of figure out some things together. So kindergarten, uh, we're building on basically what we did in the previous week. So the previous week's lessons, and I know uh, if you've never tuned in before, I have a weird schedule. I see kids once every seven school days. I have 1,200 students and they're all mine. There is no other music teacher at my school. I'm the only one. So um, that means that I see kids very infrequently. So some of the kids who I taught my, fir my first round lessons to, I had not seen for four weeks or three weeks or something because of winter break. Four weeks, actually. And so that first lesson back, especially with kindergarten, is a lot of like process and procedure and like getting them back into the swing of things. Um, and there are still kids out for flu and whatever. So, so it's a lot of like just getting back on track. Um, so in this lesson, what we did, um, they came in, we did our little circle. Uh, we In the last lesson, we learned Ba Ba Black Sheep. And so, but we just learned it not as a song, we learned it as a poem. And my friend the sheep came out and we actually did it first as Ba Ba White Sheep because she has white wool. Ba, and um, I've decided to name this puppet U, E-W-E, -E, which is only slightly confusing, for, like all involved. Um, because we had to talk about how it's not Y-O-U, like the sight word, it's E-W-E, because U means female sheep. Yeah, and so we, and then we talked about a ram and a U and a lamb, and it was, it was a very exciting moment. But it's, uh, you know, silly, but fun to give context and fun to, like, give students those new vocabulary words. Anyway, so you and I, 
you and I. You and I taught them Baba White Sheep as a poem first, and we ex as we went through, we explained all the different parts. So like we said, like, you know, you can shear a sheep, you can cut off its fleece, and it doesn't hurt. It's just like getting, you know, a haircut. So you can um, shear the sheep, and then what happens to the wool? Well, you can turn it into lots of things like scarves or uh, sweaters or um, all sorts of things. You can make it into yarn. Yeah, and so uh, we talked about all the things you can do. And if we did shear off your wool, how much would we get? A lot. How much? A lot. I don't know. Well, if you were going to bag it up, how many bags do you think there'd be? Well, more than one. Probably about three, maybe four. Okay. On a good day, four. Okay. So if we sheared off your wool, there'd be maybe three bags. And what would you do with the three bags? Well, we'd give one to the master. So we went through the poem basically like that and explained because it. I feel like if I if I just say like, okay, here's this random poem, ba ba black sheep, have you any wool? Yes sir, yes sir, three bags full. One for the master, one for the dame, one for the little boy who lives down the lane. Repeat that, everyone. They don't know what any of those words mean. I mean, they know what some of them mean, but they don't know what all of them mean. So taking the sheep puppet and sort of walking through it and talking about, oh, you can cut off its fur. That's called a fleece, and you can. What can you, you can bag it up because you use it for other things. That gives some more context to like, why are, why are we bagging it? What are we bagging up? What's, what are the three bags full of? Well, they're full of wool. Oh, okay. So giving them that context, I think is really important, especially when you get to like the master and the dame and the little boy who lives down the lane. We talk about um, what dame is or, you know, dame means like a woman's uh, referring to a woman and the master's like the person who owns the sheep. Anyway, so we talk through all of that. In, in the coming lessons, the sheep will, the Baba black sheep will turn into, or sorry, Baba white sheep turns into Baba black sheep and then it'll turn into the song. So actually, the after we did it, the sheep talked about um, another sheep. Yes, the black sheep with the black wool. Yeah, and I actually have, a, I had a picture that I projected up onto the screen so students could see what a black sheep looked like. Because um, you have black skin, but white wool, which is sort of confusing. But the, um, Yes, but that's what I am, yeah. And then we um, saw pictures of white sheep with a white face and white wool. And then we saw a picture of a sheep with black uh, black um, skin and black wool. And um, we talked about, we connected it, oh my gosh, to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer because people made fun of him. Yeah, because of the way he looked, yeah. And so then we, we can, you, you said, some people make fun of black sheep. Yeah, they don't like them. Oh, why not? Well, they're not the same as the white ones. There are lots and lots and lots of white sheep, but there aren't very many black sheep. And, and they're special. Yeah, they are. They're really, they are. But some people, just like Rudolph got made fun of because of his nose, because he was special, black sheep get made fun of because they're special. Yeah. I mean, it, if you really want to get technical, you could talk about how black wool, it like doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't wind as well or something. It, it says something about the wool, like, uh, people who use yarn and make wool, like make things out of wool, don't really like the black wool because it gets in with the white and messes it all, it taints the coloring or something and it fades a lot faster. Anyway, I don't go into that with students, but <laughs> I make it a character lesson about how like we don't, you know, make fun of people because of the way they look and just because they're different doesn't mean that's bad. And so anyway, so we decided why not change the story instead of making it about a white sheep, make it about a black sheep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did. So we did bah, bah, black sheep. But, the, but initially when we did it, we did white sheep because that's what most kids have seen before. And also your wool is white. Yes. Can I go now? Yeah, I'm hungry. Okay. Bye, everyone. Okay. And so it's nice. It's fun to have the sheep as sort of as an, as an example. You don't need to have the puppet there, but it's fun to have the puppet and it's fun to have that conversation. And then the sheep, my sheep, you can explain that to students. And because she is a sheep, she sort of has that like authority of being able to tell that and, and give them all that information. Anyway, all that to say, Ba Ba Black Sheep, and it starts out as sort of a character lesson. We just do it as a poem first, um, and then next week we're going to turn it, we're going to sing it. But we learn it as a poem first so we can get through the process of it. In this lesson, then we'll do a little bit of soul fetch. We're going to do soul me. I'm so very excited about that. Um, we sang a song called Willem, He Had Seven Sons. And that's one um, that I think I got from a Fire Robin book. And um, 
it's just a fun song. It's in um, a minor key and it goes through seven sons and the things that they do. And it's a cool, I think in the original book that he suggests that you go and each verse, the sons can do something different and the kids can choose what they want to do. I, I don't really have the time for that. And also um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's tough to remember all of that when I, I want this to sort of be a quicker activity. So I choose what the seven kids do. Um, and they, we have so much fun with that song. I'll try and track down it if there's a version of that online. And then in the last week's lesson, we went over to the xylophone and I had tipped it on its side and we learned Jack and Jill the poem with mallets. And there's one mallet for Jack, one mallet for Jill. I have a whole video about this procedure if you're interested in seeing the whole lesson top to bottom of how that works. Um, and then... Um, what we do in this lesson, instead of me holding the mallets, because at the and in the last lesson there was like not enough time for the kids to do it. It was just sort of like I had to show them the poem and then show them how it worked on the xylophones, and then time was up. So in this lesson, I call up kids, one to hold Jack, one to hold Jill, and they, they get to move the, the mallets up and down the xylophone, going up and down the hill, and they have so much fun with that, and this is a chance for them to get on the instruments and explore, and I'm standing right there to help them, not to say like, you're doing that wrong. I mean, the xylophone is tipped up on its side, each kid has a mount and they're supposed to be rambunctious Jack and rambunctious Jill. So if they're a little bit excited, that's okay. Um, but it, what I love is like the very first time a kid hits too hard and a mallet, or sorry, and a bar bounces off the xylophone. Um, I say, oh my good, can I see Jack for a second? And I hold that kid's mallet, I go, Jack, too hard. And instead of telling the kid, oh, you hit too hard, you knocked the bar off and making the kid feel bad, I say it to the mallet, Jack. And when you, t when you sort of redirect that redirection to the mount or to the puppet or to the whatever the kid holds instead of to the kid. The kid gets the idea, oh, not so hard, but also you're not saying it right to them. Does that make sense? You're, you're giving that redirection and that um, correction to the inanimate object that they are holding and using for the activity. I saw Lynn Kleiner do this once and I thought it was the most brilliant thing. It was, I think she had a, a thing, kids had finger puppets at that point and she, you know, if a kid was doing something silly, she would go over to the puppet and say like, no, I'm so sorry. You need to, this, this child you're with is trying to do the very best. You can't get him off track. And, and so it was just so funny to see that, but it works for anything. If the kid is holding a picture or a, a, a clip art or a picture or a whatever, or if they're holding a finger puppet or if they have a mallet or whatever, you can go and redirect that inanimate object and it helps redirect the kid. It's a super cool trick I saw Lynn Kleiner do and I immediately tried it and it worked so well. But it, so if the kids are up there doing Jack and Jill and one of them gets too rambunctious, talk to the mallet, don't talk to the kid. Because the mallets, you know, embody Jack and Jill and then that helps redirect. Okay, and so like I said, there's a whole video about that whole procedure. If you're interested in it, you can watch that whole thing. And then we do fish, fish, little fish. And um, in the last lesson, we, we learned this with students. And of course I have an octopus puppet and um, I call him Ollie, Ollie Octopus. And um, we have so much fun with him. And then um, I have these little fish puppets. And, um, and so we sing the song, fish, fish, little fish, I am going to catch you. Fish, fish, little fish, get into my mouth. <laughs> and the kids love it because Ollie is like, you know, enjoying his snack. And I'm like, wait, where did, where did the fish go? Where did it go? And Ollie's like, Whoa. and the kids go, Ollie ate him. And so then I just set Ollie down in my lab and I go, did Ollie really eat him? And when I pull it up, I go, Ollie, did you eat him? And he goes, he's not there anymore. And I've like hidden <laughs> like the fish puppet in my lap. And they're like, <sighs> and I go, well, that was a very sad, a very sad thing. But luckily that's not going to happen again because we're, there are no more little, oh no. There's another fish. Hello. And so we, we sing the song. It's very fun. And the, and this is where I started to break the fourth wall because at some point I say, is Ollie really eating these little fish? And they go, maybe. And I'm like, wait, let's see where Ollie's mouth is. Because octopus, their, their mouth is underneath them. So Ollie, show them your mouth. Do you see it? Ollie doesn't really have a mouth because he's a puppet. And so I break the fourth wall by saying like, Ollie's a puppet. Ollie is not really eating any other puppets. It's okay. But I do that while like Ollie is not listening, you know? And then I was like, did you see my beak? Did you see my mouth? And they're like, yeah, we did, right? But the cool thing is that um, then I have enough of these little fish puppets to give one to each student. So then they get to have a little fish. And I say, can, 
is there a way that you could pretend that you have Ollie the octopus and they can do that with their hand and then that Ollie can eat it. But it's a super simple little song and super fun and eventually we're gonna add a game to it. But when we learned it the first time, we sort of sit in a small group um, and I, I do it myself, one with the octopus puppet on one hand and the little fish on the other, and then I give the kids the opportunity to actually have their own little fish and then they get to pretend there's an octopus on their hand. It is so silly and so much fun to see them do that, but they get really into it and then they don't think about the singing because it's just part of what they're doing. And it's one of the first times that the kids are um, like just so into the song and so into, um, it's so into the fun that they don't think about like, oh, I'm using my singing voice. And it's just, it's a, a really cool moment to see. But I, like I said, I have enough of those little fish puppets that I can have kids do that. And there's a whole video on that whole lesson if you're interested too. Okay, that, <laughs> I told more than I probably should have about kindergarten because um, it took a little bit longer. But I wanted to talk through some of those steps. Um, first grade, we're also doing a sheet poem. So guess what? You comes back, you my sheep. And we do Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep. I actually have little um, sheep clip art little, that I had for a bulletin board. Um, like a couple years ago, I used for a, for a farm program for a bulletin board. And um, I, I cut out all these little farm animals. Anyway, I took all the sheep and I just sort of stuck them around the room. And some of the other classes were like, why are there sheep everywhere? And I was like, well, we just learn Little Bo Peep. And they're like, mm, okay. Well, anyway, so my first grade, I say she's lost the sheep. And that's when they start to notice there are sheep all around the room. And we spot some and we talk about it. And then we learn the poem and it goes right with it. Um, and you, the puppet, comes out to help. Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep and doesn't know where to find them. Then we do um, hunt the cows. Wake up, you sleepy heads and go. Wake up, you sleepy heads and go and find the cattle. Wake up, you sleepy heads and go and hunt the cows. The cows are lost, the sun is warm, I think I'll wait till they come home. And that's, um, I think I first saw that in um, this book called Farm Sounds by Lynn Kleiner. And this is a really fantastic book. Um, a lot of the time I see, um, a lot of the times I've shared about these, these um, books by Lynn Kleiner. They're super wonderful. And my first graders are gearing up for um, a zoo themed concert and so um what we do in this we, we've learned a couple songs that are sort of farm related and eventually we're going to change out some of those words um so this one wake up you sleepy heads and go and find the cattle wake up you sleepy heads and go and hunt the cows is going to turn into zookeepers who need to go and find the animals that have escaped and that's going to change sort of into our song eventually um, but this is a really great resource it has um Lots of really wonderful songs in here. If you're doing a farm concert, farm program, this has some really good stuff in it. It also has an accompaniment CD. Um, in the back of each of these books, they have um, like little activities and things. If you're a, like a church um, school teacher or you're doing this for a summer program or something, you need like a little activity to go along with it. Um, there's some really cool things in the back, but this is just one of several of her books that I like, and she's not paying me to say this, but it's really, really cool stuff, and you should go check it out. Um, anyway, so we do uh, Hunt the Cows. It sort of goes in with the Little Bo Peep, um, and then we go to another song from a Lynn Kleiner book called uh, We're Going to the Jungle Today. Oh, we're going to the jungle today. Oh, yeah. Oh, we're going to the jungle today. Bum, ba, -dum, bum, 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 ba, da, da, da. Okay, I gotta um, turn off some people here on Facebook so it looks like I got some bots, which is interesting. Um, anyway, um, so there's some really cool books in here, or some really cool songs in this book. And like I said, this one, uh, We're Going to the Jungle Today, is gonna sort of become another zoo related one um, eventually. And um, in this in this lesson, we first learn the parts and we learn it by rote, we learn it phrase by phrase. And then um, once we've learned that, um, we sort of segue to Matilda the Gorilla, which is another fun little animal song. Each of these things, we're not taking very long with them. We're just taking a sort of a short amount of time and learning bits and pieces of it because it'll sort of culminate in the, um, the full song later when the concert sort of rolls around, which is not too far away. But uh, both of these books that I just shared about, Farm Sounds and Jungle Beat, are great books. They're both by Lynn Kleiner, and I've linked them on the links page. I'm not sure you can get them right now, both from Amazon. I think you can get a couple if you wanted them. Um, 
but they're they're really great books and it's Lynn Kleiner K L E I N E R Lynn L Y N N both super great books and another song that I, or another book that she did is SOS Songs of the Sea that's a great book too okay second grade is also prepping for a concert they're prepping for a concert which is sort of like a around the world concert so in the last lesson we learned bate bate chocolate um, we sort of recap that and that leads into um, some echoing clapping and some things is sort of the uh, a section of a rondo form that we um, that we do where is the poem and then um, clapping and poem and clapping and poem and clapping or poem and, and echoing um, but Bate Bate Chocolate, that's from Mexico. We do Merrily We Roll Along. And that last week I talked a little bit about um, the questions I asked. What can we see here? What can we do here? What can we eat here? What can we say? Those are things that I sort of um, added it in between the poem. And, and it lets us sort of talk about different um different countries around the world and the languages they speak and the things they do and different foods they eat and maybe different ways they eat. It's sort of fun. We brought back London Bridge. I didn't have very much time for it last. Um, I didn't have very much time for it last. Sorry, I have some bots here I'm going to have to block on Facebook. Um, we didn't have much time in the last lesson to um, to do London Bridge, so we come back and bring it back a little bit more because that's going to come in later for the concert. And then we do Eyes the Bye That Built the Boat. And I talked about that last week, the song from Newfoundland. Um, it's a super cute song, but it's a little confusing for students at first. Students who are just learning the language they're in second grade they're learning english and this sort of messes them up because it's more of a colloquial version of of english and so um i have, I, I usually teach instead of going eyes the bay that built the boat eyes the bay that sailed her eyes the bay that catches the fish and brings them home to lizer which is what we will eventually get to i simplify it down and the first time i do it the way you'd hear it in georgia well i don't know about georgia but the way that i would do it is i'm the boy that built the boat i'm the boy that sailed it i'm the boy that catches the fish and brings them home to liza and then once we've learned the contour of the melody and we've learned some of the original words and we can change i'm the boy to eyes the by and and then make it more of the original but that's just sort of a stepping stone that, that gets us to that final song um, one other thing that I, I do in my lesson plans that I wanted to share is like, there, you know, as much as I wish that I like knew every song in the whole wide world, if there's a new song um, or a newer song or new something that I'm going to put in that I'm afraid that like in the fray of the day I'm going to forget, um, I copy off just that one song or I find a version of it online that I can print freely. Um, I print it off if there are any actions or things, I stick it on the back. Like La Raspa is going to come up next week in these lessons and if I, or at the end of this lesson if I have extra time. And so I print it off and I three hole punch it and I stick it in my lesson plan binder in case I get to it and I go, I don't know how that goes. I can just flip the page instead of like rustling around and looking for the book or trying to find it or where did I put that book. If I put it with my lesson plans, it means that like I can just flip the page and there it is. And maybe I won't need it at all, but it's nice to just have it there. Unless it's a song that I've done a hundred thousand times. If it's a newer song, I will put a copy of it in my lesson plans in case I just need to quickly reference it. Okay, third grade, um, they're gonna, they come in, we're doing fa for the first time, which is so very exciting. Um, and then we and we sort of do that as a, an echo back and forth. We do some patterns. We do some new introductions of that. Um, we sing Sarah Sponda, which we did in a previous lesson, um, and we add uh, some new stuff to it. So if you don't know Sarah Sponda, it goes Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, ret set set. Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, ret set set. Adoreo, adore boom deo. A do re boom de ret set set a se paseo. So there's um it's a, a super simple little song. I found online um a uh, sorry, thanks for people on Facebook who are, are correcting links and things. If you're having trouble finding the links page, thanks Jennifer for posting that. Um there's a, a video online of a simple um a, a very simple um stick pattern and um and uh, what I do the very first time is I do it as a clapping pattern instead of a stick pattern. So um, the version goes sort of like this. 
Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, ret, set, set. And when I go down, I'm hitting the ground. Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, Sarah Sponda, ret, set, set. Adoreo, adore boom deo. Adore boom day, ret, set, set. Ase paseo. And if you are, if you are listening to this, um, weeks later as a podcast and not watching it on a video. I'm sorry, I'm doing some actions with my hands. You can go back and watch it or there's a video linked to the links page. But um, so we learn it as a clapping pattern first. And the very first time I do it, I have students all facing me and we do the actions. I mirror them so that they can do the right and the left and whatever. Um, and then we get to the point where students can then face each other and they can do this together where then they're connecting with their partner um, instead of just putting their hand up they're put, they're connecting with their partner sort of doing a sort of a patty cake sort of a thing eventually in this lesson um we trade out our hands for lummy sticks and so then um students will take their sticks and they can do sarah sponda sarah sponda sarah sponda ret set set sarah sponda sarah sponda sarah sponda ret set set adoreo adore boom deo adore boom de ret set set ase paseo so that they can do that with lummy sticks instead the the thing that then changes is on adoreo the first time I say, uh, you know, do a pose with your stick. So you do a do re o, a do re boom de o, or you can do a do re o, a do re boom de o, whatever the kids want to do. And then what it eventually turns into the final form is that on do re o, students have to find a way to switch sticks with their partner. They can toss. I don't ever. T I don't ever give that as the first example. I say you can hand across like this. You can put your two, st two sticks out and hand them to your partner, and they'll hand theirs to you. You can set them on the ground and then pick up their sticks. But you have to find a way to switch sticks on adoreo and be ready to go. So you go a switch reo, a switch re boom deo. You got it, and you have to do it quickly so that you can be ready for the click click. So the the final form goes something like this. Sarah Sponda, Sarah left, or sorry, Sarah Sponda, Sarah right hand, Sarah left hand, both, both, both. Sarah Sponda, Sarah right hand, Sarah left hand, both, both, both. Switch your sticks, Rayo. Switch your sticks, Ray, boom, Dayo. And do, re, boom, day, red, set, set. Ase, passe, ase, passe, yo. I'm having trouble trying to uh, flip the sticks and say the different words. And also look at myself backwards on my FaceTime camera. Sorry about that. So um, we do that with the sticks. They a lot of times they'll get tossed in this the switching part. I'm fine with that. They they can find some really fun things to do. Now the lummy sticks I use in case you're interested. Um, they come in let's see, uh, four different colors. So red, blue, green, yellow, which is fabulous because the four teams that I use in my class for classroom management. Um, the strings, percussion, woodwinds, and brass. I've talked about that before. Each one has its own color, and those colors are red, blue, green, and yellow. So I have colors, one for each team, which just happened to work out. I did not buy specific sticks to match the colors. It just happened to, to work out that way. But um, these sticks are super great. They're plastic. They're hollow. Um, it, so you can sort of maybe see that. But that means that if they get tossed or thrown, they don't hurt very much if they accidentally hit you in the head. They don't have a lot of heft to them like wooden sticks do. So they don't carry as much weight or um, if they're moving fast, they don't hurt if they hit your hand or, or face or whatever. So these are really great sticks. They're also like just the perfect length so that the kids can grab on and, and do stuff with them, but they're not like, you know, rhythm sticks can sometimes be too long or the, the short, too short. And so these would seem to like just the right size. Um, and like I said, they're hollow, they're wonderful, and they, they make nice clicking. They're not too loud or whatever. So like I've been able to use them. They're pretty versatile. If you're interested in that, they are on the links page too if you want to get a set just like this. But if you have your own rhythm sticks, you can use your own rhythm sticks. These are just have been super phenomenal for what I'm using them for, which is a lot of tossing and clicking and stuff. Um, and these actually came from a PE catalog. You can I, I have the listing to the Amazon their listing on Amazon, but you can actually get them from I think it's called US Games is the PE catalog you can get them in. Okay, so that's third grade. Oh, and then we do a whole thing about, for the first time, using whiteboards and erasers to make 
the notes that in standard notation. So quarter notes, uh, eighth notes, quarter rests, half note, half rests, whole note, whole rests, and now sixteenth notes, which we just learned in the previous lesson. So we're actually sitting down and, and writing them out and doing it with a dry erase marker. I, uh, last year I showed a whole long video about how I do that and the process. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Okay, fourth grade and fifth grade are going to sort of meld together in this next section because um, I, that's what I was going to do my deep dive on is ukulele. Um, I see someone on Instagram asking, have you already talked about strum it up? Nope, I'm about to. Um, but the, the fourth and fifth grade, last year I did fourth and fifth grade and the lessons were basically the same for both grades because it was the very first time we done ukulele. So they were both sort of learning at the same pace. Fifth grade a tiny bit faster than fourth grade last year. Um, but basically we're learning the same things at the same time. This year, fourth grade is basically following the pattern that we did last year and fifth grade is doing an accelerated, remember how we do this so that we can go on to, to trickier things. Um, so when I'm teaching ukulele for the first time, um, I have this really simple little PowerPoint that I've adapted from um, one of my good friends who I taught, um, I taught with was in my ORF chapter in Michigan. She sent me her like, how does she start ukulele? Because I had no idea. And um, so this is sort of based on what she did. And so what I what I do with students when they first come in for their first ukulele lesson, we, we look at a couple things um, before we do anything else. Um, I actually hold up my ukulele next to my guitar and I have them talk about similarities and differences, things that they can see, things that they know. It's so cool to see what they can, um, what they can pull from their schema or what they see and can tell. It's cool to see that. But anyway, I hold them up next to each other. We, we do a little bit of that so they can see it's similar but not exactly the same. Um, and then we go through this quick PowerPoint. So let me see if I can zoom in. So it says ukulele time on the screen. And then um, you know, we go through the classroom rules and these are also adapted from my friend Denise who um, wasn't part of my ORF chapter in Michigan. Rule number one, I will take out and put away the ukulele carefully. Rule number two, I will play and sing all songs with a positive attitude. And three, I will learn to strum and play chords on, on the ukulele in a variety of ways. So those are just sort of my very simple rules, but it's, it's, it definitely sets us up um, for productive time playing the ukulele and it gives some parameters. So I can always go back to and say, are you being careful with the ukulele? You know, or I could say, I don't know, is this a very positive attitude? Or especially when things get tricky, it's nice to have, <laughs> nice to have that on there. Um, so actually then I pull out my ukulele and I hold it up and I say, you know, on the ukulele, if the ukulele were a person, there'd be three parts. There'd be the body and the head and what connects your body to your head, your neck. Okay, so here's the neck. And so we talk a little bit about that. And then I say, if we zoomed in on just this part of the ukulele, here's what we would see. And then on the PowerPoint is a, a zoomed in part of the top of the neck and the head. Um, and I talk about the uh, each little part. I say there are tuners or tuning pegs. Um, each of those gold lines, it just looks like lines in that picture. But when you touch and hold your ukulele, you're going to feel that those are actually like little speed bumps. They're actually raised up. And those are called frets. And so there are lots of little golden frets. And the very end where it looks like there should be one last fret, there's actually not. It's white. And that's not called a fret. That's called the nut. I don't know why people call it that. I wonder, why don't they call it the apple? Why isn't it called the hamburger? I don't know, but somebody called it the nut. So that's what we call it. And the frets and then the nut. And then away on the other side, there's another sort of a white line. And that's called the bridge. That part is the bridge. I don't know. Why isn't it the tunnel? Why isn't it the car or whatever? And that kid gets kids from not laughing so much about nut, which is apparently the funniest thing in the world. Um, so, but, but talking about it like that and then moving on right on helps kids to sort of move right on. Um, one of the other things that I talk about on my ukuleles is um, if you look at the ukuleles on the bridge, you can see that one has a shark and one has a dolphin. And we, we talk a little bit about that and then I you know, mention the other ukuleles that we have. Um, and when we see them, I say, you know, they're all tropical colors. And one of the reasons is because the ukulele became very popular on islands. Um, it was an easy instrument to to move and to carry around. And you, I mean, not like a piano, you couldn't really take that on a ship with you to go to an island, but the ukulele was great. And so that's why a lot of times, because they're so popular on the islands, you'll find them with sharks or dolphins or tropical flowers or tropical colors, you'll find them that way. And that, that links really well to what we have in our hands in our classroom. 
But before we actually get to putting our hands on ukuleles, um, we talk about our hands. So I show them this picture and I say you have four fingers and one thumb on each hand and hold up your right hand and I have this picture and I say, you know, when you count out your hand, um, like you're counting in English, usually you count one, two, three, four, and you know, I hold up your index finger for one, add your middle finger for two, um, add your ring finger for three, and um, pinky for four. And so I say that when we talk about your fingers when playing ukulele, we count them like, like that, finger one, finger two, finger three, finger four, and your thumb, which we don't care so much about. Okay, and then left hand is the same thing. We go through that same process. We count out one, two, three, and four, and I show them both hands, their first, second, third, and fourth fingers. So. Let me show you a little trick, and this is something that I learned from um, Lorelai Batislaum, who is just totally fabulous, and on the links page there's a link to, um, I was able to do a podcast with her about using ukulele in an elemental way, like um, in the vein of Orff Schulberg, and um, talking about that it was such an eye-opening conversation and, and really great, and then I was able to see her present about ukuleles at Texas Music Educators last year, and she is just so brilliant, so if you ever have the chance to see Lorelai present, you should go do it. Uh, but one of the things that she showed us at last year at the workshop was she does finger exercises with her students and uh, it sort of goes like this. She has them hold up their right hand and says, okay, finger one, tap finger one to your thumb. Great. Now finger two, finger three, finger four. Great. And then that's how I have them start. And then um, she has them do a little exercise where they do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Finger two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Finger three, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Finger four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Great. Can you do it four times for each finger? Here we go. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. And like one time with kids, I have to say, do you know why I'm saying two, two, three, four? And they go, and one kid's like, it's because that's finger two. And the other kids are like, oh. <laughs> they get, so anyway, I have to do that once and then I never have to talk about it again. Okay, and then after we do it four on each finger, I say do two times, two times. One, two, 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 three, two, four, two. Do it again. One, two, 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 three, two, four, two. Do once for each finger. Four times. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Great. Okay, now shake out that hand. Oh, yeah. And at this point, some kids are like, why is he doing this? And so sometimes they'll say, why do you think I'm doing this? And they go, oh, it's to exercise your fingers. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the reason why. But I And I let them come up with a couple other answers too. But then I say, you know, how often in daily life do you do this movement or this movement, or this movement, or this movement with your fingers. How often? And they go like, never. Yeah, you do this for texting, you do this for video games, you do this for computers, you do this for iPads, but you hardly ever really do this. But when you play ukulele, your fingers are doing exactly that. Those are the shapes that your fingers are making. And so we're training our fingers without a ukulele in our hands. We're training our fingers to do that shape so that we can then do it on the ukulele. So then we move to left hand, we do the same thing. If you want to get really ambitious, you can do it with both hands. Um, so eight, four, two, two, one, 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 one. You can do it with a backing track if you want, with a rhythm track, you can do it just uh, a cappella. There are so many cool things that you can do with this. You can take it to you know the nth degree by doing like you know one side to the next. You could skip. If you get really good, at it. Um, but it's it it is a little bit infuriating for the kids to do this with their fingers. They don't really like it, <laughs> but it is really good for them. It builds dexterity, and it, it, like I said, especially when we move on after like week three or week four, and they're like, "Why are we still doing this?" I'm like, "Because you know this is tricky." And guess what? If you put the ukulele in the way, all you need is that one finger down, and you've got the C chord, and so it's good practice. And with the kids who are like sports i'm so cool i always say like you know when you're in basketball practice do you ever practice free throws i'm like yeah all the time I'm like yeah but this is the same thing you're, you when you do free throws you're teaching your body the muscle memory you're teaching your body how to do that so that when you're in a game it just comes naturally we're teaching our fingers how to do this so that when we get to playing it'll just come naturally and then some kids are like oh, okay 
some kids are still like, why am I doing this? But, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's fun to, to get them to do that. And then we, then we move on to ukuleles. And the very first time um, we actually do stuff with ukuleles, I have them take the ukulele and I have them mirror me and whatever I'm doing, they just mirror. Um, and so they go, you know, however we want. I have them I actually turn it around and then look at what's on the fretboard. Um, and then we turn it back around so that they can just, they're, like I said, just mirrors, just normal mirrors. Um, and so then we end up to a spot where um, when they put it up next to them, um, when they put it up next to them, um, it's in the position that it needs to be for the for playing the ukulele. And um, I mirror them for this first activity just for strumming so that they can sort of see um, the correct position. So because they will just keep mirroring. So instead of saying like, I'm gonna be your opposite, I just, for the first time through for fourth grade, I just have them mirror and they get into the right spot. So um, it's tucked up against their body. One hand is over top, um, sort of on the edge here of the ukulele. And I always talk about, you know, when you strum, you don't strum over the sound hole. That was a revelation to me when I first started learning ukulele. I didn't know that. You actually strum here where the neck meets the body. And I say um, with my kids, like if you can strum right here, sort of at the end of the, the brown, between the brown and the next color, that's a great place to strum. Um, and then this hand, we just get it out of the way and we just practice strumming for a little while. Um, just so they can get that sensation. Now, with when my kids do it, um, the ukulele is in here. We talk about how to strum. You want to try and get all four fingers. I could go on and be like, here's the exact amazing, correct procedure. But kids just want to play at this point. It's been maybe 20 minutes. They're like, we've been thinking too long. <laughs> and so they want to just start playing. So I have them get this hand um, on the neck where it's out of the way, where it's not touching strings. And your other hand, we just start strumming. Um, and so I, for my beginners, I say, show me a thumbs up. Great, now move that hand, don't change anything, just move that hand down to the strings and you're gonna strum just like that. And you're gonna keep that thumbs up position. Eventually later on in the year, I'll let them switch their hand to be open or they can use their index finger or whatever. But just initially as like a, here's one way to do it. We do it with our hand with our finger closed like that. And then we, we spend some time strumming down. We spend some strum, time strumming just up. We do a mix of that. This first day is a lot of just strumming because kids, to, it, it is so cool and great to get that down really well before you try and do anything with your other hand because that in and of itself, the strumming is tricky for a lot of kids, especially getting all four strings every time you do it or consistently or gently or whatever. Um, one of the things Lorelai said in her presentation was don't do this like a big, like, you know, overblown version of the action is like an example for them because they will do that exact thing. So she's like, I always just now I model the way I want to see them actually play it. And that's a better model, a better example for them for them to follow. Okay, I kind of sort of, sort of zip ahead because I'm running out of time. And also apparently at Facebook, there are a lot of bots who are asking if there's a couch auction. So sorry for all the people <laughs> watching on Facebook and seeing random spam. I've been trying to block and um, get rid of them while doing this video. So that's been sort of fun. But if you see some random comment on Facebook about a couch auction, apparently that's what the bots are now talking about. Okay, so a couple more things. Um, one really cool thing inspired by Lorelai, one of the things she said is, you know, usually a ukulele is tuned G, C, E, A, gotta catch them all, or uh, George Clooney eats apples. I've heard a lot of different things to help remember what um, note is which. But she said if you take and you tune down this fourth string, G, C, E, G, then you have a C chord. So when the kids strum, they just have a chord. So you can spend a day or two just on the strumming. And if they're strumming, just open, then they have a C chord. You can do a bunch of songs with that. Um, you know, anything that uses like a Bordeaux pattern that you might put on a bass xylophone, you can now do on ukuleles. Um, and if you have just that string tuned down, so it's G, C, E, G, you have a C chord and they can go like crazy and you can spend all that time focusing on strumming patterns, which is tricky. When you're ready, um, I, I, can, I don't really have that luxury because I'm doing fourth and fifth at the same time. And so if all the ukuleles were tuned 
to the C chord, my fifth graders would be really confused when we're trying new chords. They wouldn't know what's going on. So I haven't tried that this year. I'd like to try it next year and maybe start fourth grade a week or two before fifth grade so that they're not going concurrently and I can spend that week on just a C chord. But um, so this is tuned correctly. So let me show you, show you a couple of things on the ukulele. I have these dots on the fretboard and these dots are just uh, Avery stick labeled uh, removable co color coded dots. I don't know what exactly they're supposed to be for. I guess for putting on your planner. No, but um, so I have them on the ukulele. They're same for all of mine. You can use whatever colors you want up here. If you have a specific system you want to use, great. But for me, I just have um, each one as a specific marker so that when we're playing in class, that kids will be able to use the colors to match up to play a chord. So for example, when we're playing C, all they have to do is match up um, their finger onto the blue dot and that's a C chord. Or I say ketchup and mustard, first finger on the red one for ketchup, second finger on the yellow for mustard, that's an F chord. And then we learn G7, so you keep your first finger on the red, you add the two greens, you got G7. Or you could do just yellow, just the mustard, and then that gives you an A minor. So these are all just simple little things to sort of help them, and it is, it is, it is worth it. To <laughs> To have these on here instead of like saying, okay, third fret, first finger, lowest string. It's way easier to say, put your third finger on the blue dot. And so um, for now at the beginning, it's it's so nice to have that. Um, one other thing that I would get all the time is I would have students put their whole hand, the whole heel of their hand on the back of the ukulele. They would super mess up their fingers up here and it made it really tricky for them to put their fingers in the right places. Well, at my friend's school, um, I saw it on the back of her ukulele, she had a little Velcro dot. And this is just this, a soft Velcro dot. I'm, pro I'm pretty sure I'm gonna be frustrated myself for using white dots. I should use black dots so I don't get dirty. But um, the dot gives the kids a place to put their thumb so that every time they put their hand on the ukulele, that's where your thumb goes. And so they don't have to worry about like, well, I don't know is what I'm doing right and their hand won't just migrate. This is a place where their thumb needs to go. I do the same thing with my recorder. Um, when I teach kids recorder, let's see if I've got a recorder here I can show you. Um, on the back of the recorder, um, on the bottom for your right hand where there's not a place for your right hand to go, I put a little um, hole reinforcer right here so then like that's where their other thumb goes. But but in both cases, the recorder and the ukulele, it gives them a place to put down their fingers so they know exactly where it goes so they're not confused and you can then give them a quick reference for that. So once we've got the strumming down, then we add in our first chord, which is C, and our second chord, which is F, and we do a lot of switching back and forth. There's some really cool places on YouTube where you can get play-alongs, um, where you can play along with the sound on the screen. Um, I suggest you go check out uh, my interview with Lorelai Batislong on my podcast from a couple years ago, and there's a link on the links page. But she talks through a couple um, apps and things that are really, really helpful. Um, there's one app called the Amazing Slow Downer, which she talks about, which slows down a tempo to a recorded song and also can transpose it so that if it's not in a key that's friendly for ukulele, you can change that so that it is. Um, but we talk a little bit at length about that and some other procedures and things you might do as you start teaching ukulele. That conversation I had with her was amazingly helpful as I started to think about how I wanted to teach the ukulele so that it fit in with everything else we were doing in sort of an Orff Schulwerk um, themed classroom because that's really what they're getting all the time. So having that conversation with her helped me sort of see how I could integrate ukulele with Orff. Um, another great resource you might try is this book called Strum It Up. This is by uh, Sandy Lance and Gretchen Wahlberg. Um, I saw this book for the first time when I was at um, the American Orff Schulwerk Association National Conference last year. They did a whole session about uh, ukulele in the elemental Orff classroom. And then this was a book that they had just written. All the songs in here are themed along with that. They have a little bit of information about how you might start um, with ukulele, a little bit about posture and sitting and playing and strumming ideas. Um, and then they have um, some things about the Hawaiian language. They have some really cool um, songs in here that would be super helpful. And they have a sort of um, 
laid out so that you get into the single chord songs, double chord songs using F and C, so things that are easy and then switch into more difficult things later. It's, it's a great resource and as we go along in my class I'm going to be doing play alongs from YouTube and also pulling songs that, that fit right in with what we'd be doing in class um, from this book. So great resource also on the links page. Okay, thanks so much for spending time with me this week. I really appreciate you coming along. If you're at GMEA this week in Georgia or um, South Carolina SCMEA in two weeks, I would love to see you. Um, I hope we can connect in real life and not just on the, the computer or on, um, on these live videos. But thanks so much for coming along. I hope I'll get to see you in real life. And if you have any questions, leave them on um, Facebook or Instagram, and I'll try and get to them soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great night. Bye, Facebook. Thanks, everyone.